We are in uh, part three of four on some of these sayings of Jesus. I'm going to start off this morning in Matthew 10, if you want to join us there. I'll be in Matthew 10 to start today. I want to remind you that, uh, that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke specifically, that what's being recorded for us here is Jesus' interaction with the Jews. I've been in church my entire life. I've told you more than once that uh, I was raised to believe that everything Jesus is saying here, he's saying to us as Christians, and that's not the case. we got to take this. uh, Jesus is talking to his Jewish audience. Jesus is sitting among a Jewish people. We've got to have that in mind. we got to keep that in mind in these conversations. But in Matthew 10, well, sorry, I forgot what we had on tap today. Here's what we have on tap today. Our theology is this. Christ did not come to bring unity, but division. We'll get to that in a minute. I know already you're having questions. Good. Our application today is this. We must acknowledge and accept the cost associated with following Jesus. We must acknowledge and accept the cost associated with following Jesus. And our prayer today is this. God, give us the strength to follow Jesus with all boldness, regardless of the price. Give us the strength to follow Jesus with all boldness, regardless of the price. When I say that uh, Christ did not come to bring unity, but division... It's interesting because when we look at a a book like Ephesians, Paul talks about the unity of the church. In Ephesians 2, he says that God made one man out of two, and he's talking there about the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers, and that God brought the Jewish and Gentile believers into one man. In fact, there's a verse that gets used wrong a lot from Ephesians 2 where it says that God broke down the wall of hostility, and a lot of times people will teach that, and they'll say, God broke down the wall of hostility between us and God. That's not what Ephesians 2 is talking about. Ephesians 2, the wall of hostility was between the Jews and the Gentiles, and he took two men and made them into one man uh, in Christ, that there is unity in the body. In fact, our our name, the 456, comes from Ephesians 4, verses 4, 5, and 6, where Paul is reminding the believers in Ephesus that we have one body, we've been called to one hope by one spirit, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Paul is saying that to promote unity in the body. When Jesus says here, I did not come to bring unity, but division, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, what he's talking about here is between us and the world. He's talking, he's about to send out the the 12 disciples. He's going to send them out. And the Bible tells us in, uh, well, let me just start here in 10.1. He called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over all the unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. And then everything else in chapter 10 is what he is saying to them, charging them with as they're about to go out on this first missionary journey. And so one of the things he tells them in verse 16 is, Behold, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and as innocent of doves. Beware of the men. They're going to hand you over to courts. They're going to flog you, right? So like he is warning, he is warning uh, these 12 of what they're about to, to face. Um, and then we, we're going to start down here in verse 34. I guess technically we've already started. We're going to continue in verse 34. Jesus is saying this to the 12 that he's charging. I I just, man, I just want to stop and encourage you. It's not that there's never an application for these kinds of things. There's absolutely an application as I'm going to show you here in just a moment. But but I, I just want to remind you, like, it really matters who Jesus is talking to. Pay attention to those things, okay? So Jesus says here, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So here Christ is talking about uh, the importance of following him, of knowing him, and not only that, but knowing uh, what it's going to cost. Now, the verse he's quoting here, when he says, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law, that's from Malachi, or sorry, not Malachi, we were in Malachi last week, that's Micah 7, verse 6, and he says this, He says, the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against the mother. The daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the members of his own household. That's the verse he's quoting. It's from the Old Testament. Micah here is talking, and I need to read a little bit bigger section here from Micah. If you're a note taker, I'm reading Micah 7, 1 through 7. 
Micah says this. Uh, this is at a, a point in history where uh, God has largely um, been silent. Uh, there have been a few prophets been speaking, but most of the people of God have been taken into captivity, first into an Assyrian captivity and then a Babylonian captivity. And the people have been away from the promised land for a long time. And now the people are kind of uh, in dire straits. And Micah, who is hearing from God, says this. Micah 7, 1, Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned, and there is no more cluster to eat, and there is no ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth. There is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood. Each one is hunting the other with a net. This is not a good situation if you're not following that right now, okay? Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. I just, man, we could talk about that for a long time. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. So they're trying to do well at evil. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe. The great man utters the evil desire of his soul, and they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright of them is like a thorn hedge. The day of your watchmen and of your punishment has come, and now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. So guard yourself from your wife. For the son treats the father with contempt. Uh, can I, let me just pause here. No, 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 I won't. Not yet. Sorry, I get excited. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The man's enemies are the men of his own household. Verse 7, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation and God will hear me. So this is the situation that Micah finds himself in. He's pursuing God. He's chasing after the Lord. He's seeking to know God. And he says the whole world is in chaos. They're plunged into evil. The judges, the, the people who are supposed to do what is right, are accepting bribes. He says not only are they chasing after evil, they're seeking to do it well. They're seeking to be good at evil. And he says the very best among them is a thorn patch. The very best among them is a briar. And he goes, you should just keep your mouth quiet. You shouldn't trust your neighbor anymore. He goes, don't even, don't even trust your wife anymore. Can you, imagine, uh, can you imagine somebody just reading that verse and getting up one day and preaching it? This is how preaching happens a lot. They get up and say, don't even trust your wife anymore, men. And there's a whole sermon on that. Like, we have to have the context here, okay? So Micah is saying, I'm following hard after God. And he says, he goes, the members of your own household have become your enemies. Father-in-law or son-in-law is rising up against father-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he goes, and they are finding themselves at odds with one another. And he says, but my confidence is in the Lord. I am looking to the Lord. Now, keep in mind, when Jesus says this, here in Matthew 10, when he says, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against his, his mother-in-law. When he says, I didn't come for peace, but division. I didn't come for unity, but a sword. And he quotes this text. His Jewish disciples know the text he's talking about. They understand the context. They understand that he's quoting Micah. All right. They understand this reference. And so what he's saying is, you're about to be like Micah. You're about to be the ones who have heard from God, who are seeking God, and I'm sending you out into a group of people who are good. The best of the people are going to be like thorns and briars. And he's giving them this frame of reference. He's telling them it is about to be very difficult. And he says, for whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. A parallel text in Luke says, unless you hate your father and mother, uh, you are not worthy of me. Mark is a little more gentle with the language here. But he says, unless you, uh, anyone who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy than me of me. Whoever does not take his own cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In Luke 14, he says, you can't even be my disciple. Uh, unless these things are true. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so Jesus is s charging these guys. He's like, look, man, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. He goes, I'm sending you out to people who will seek to put you to death. I'm, seeking, uh, I'm sending you out to people who will seek to throw you into prison. I'm sending you out among the people who will seek to wreck your life. And he goes, and I need you to know, I need you to know because some people think, ah, it's, it's interesting, every now and then you'll hear somebody say something like, man, if this big time celebrity could just put their faith in Jesus, then the whole world would believe in Jesus. And you're like, man, that is just not how it works. Right? 
People are like, man, if, if you know, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, if they could have just stayed together and become Christians, then everything would have been perfect and everybody would have. That's not how it works, all right? That's not salvation. That's not faith. The, the gospel of God is, is weighty, and the gospel of God drives a wedge, not between the church, but between the church and the world. If you don't think that the world is and the church is getting that that gap is growing in, in its visibility, I don't think it's spiritually actually growing at all. I think it's always been there, but I think it's becoming more visible to us that there is a gap between the church and, and the world, right? This is what Jesus says. This is the reason that I came. Think about it like this, okay? Think about it like this. In Leviticus, which is I'm just telling you, if you're trying to read through the entire Bible and you get to Leviticus and you're like, man, I just can't ever get through Leviticus. I get it. It took me 20 years to appreciate Leviticus. Okay. It might not take you quite that long. All right. Leviticus is a tough read. Go chapter 15, all, all, all the, all the purification rites for someone who has a boil. Oh, it's a little tedious. I will never do a full sermon on purification for a boil. I just won't. I'll save you that. If you want to talk about it on Wednesday nights, we certainly can. But one of the things that God does in Leviticus is he says, I want you to do this to make a distinction between you and the rest of the world. I'm giving you these laws to make a distinction between you and the rest of the world, to make a distinction between you and the rest of the world. I want you to know that in following God, a distinction is made between those who follow God and the rest of the world. That's the division that Christ is talking about here. When you, when you sign up to follow me, he says, I am making a distinction between you and the rest of the world. And he's telling, he's warning these 12 guys, that's what you're about to face. That distinction is about to become very real. Okay? And so here we have this idea that, that God is coming to bring division. Let, let me put this in a really practical sense for you. Uh, Micah and I have both had opportunities to take some mission trips to some closed countries. And in those opportunities, when you're meeting believers, one of the things that these believers will say is that when they came to Christ, they were disowned by their family. And that's, that's on a good day. Um, some of the people were persecuted by their family, were jailed or beaten by their family. And some we hear uh, were, were even killed by their families for coming to faith in Christ. When, when I did a mission trip, uh, I, I I guess I could say where, but I probably won't. I just won't. I did a mission trip in a closed country. You can talk to me about it later. And we were, I was interviewing some of the pastors there, and, and they said that what we tell people when we tell them about faith in Christ, what we tell them is believing this and taking hold of this will put your life at risk in the next minute. The moment you say, I confess Jesus, at that moment you are divided with your culture, and the, the members of your own household literally have become your enemies, and you may die for this truth. And people are still coming to Jesus. Why? Because they love Christ more than father and mother. Okay? Very, very practically, that's kind of the situation that's happening in our world today. We, we, don't, we don't deal with that as much in the States, but that is definitely happening in places all over the world still. But our application today is this, and this is where we'll spend the bulk of our time. We must acknowledge and accept the cost associated with following Jesus. We must acknowledge and accept the cost associated with following Jesus. Every now and then, and it ticks me off, but every now and then I've heard preachers say, uh, well, Micah and I, we used to do some revival services back in the day at different churches. And one, one case in particular we were doing an invitation um, at the end of the, the service one evening and no one was responding and I'm not one to like play on emotions and really, you know, like make everybody like cry and make sure everybody comes down. But I, I had been at camps before where like the preacher won't quit until every seat is empty and every kid's up front, that kind of thing. Micah and I have both had these experiences. But one night uh, he and I were at this revival service. I had been preaching. He had been leading worship and we were done and no one was moving, and so I brought it to a close, and I moved to the front and sat down, and I handed the microphone off to the pastor so that he could tell us about what we were going to go eat dinner or whatever we were going to do after. And then he extended the invitation for like another 15 minutes, you know, because he was like, man, I just, people need to come. They need to come, right? Listen to me, um, and I need us to get this, okay? The, following Christ I want to be very careful how I say this. Wave me off, Micah, if I need to be more clear. Micah, Micah will not always. I, I, I just, if Pierce and Micah don't say anything after, to me after my sermon, I feel like it was a good day, you know? 
uh, when, they, when they come up to me, Micah occasionally will go, here's what you said, but here's what you meant. <laughs> you need to fix that. And I'm like, okay. So if I say this wrong, right, there is, there's all sorts of emotion in following Christ. There, there's, there's joy and there's peace and there's excitement. And there's, so there are some worship songs we sing that just stir me up and I have this Rocky Four kind of montage playing through my head and I want to like just go, you know, and I'm just like ready, you know. Uh, but we do not follow God because of the emotion. The emotion can't be the thing that drives us. The truth of who God is and the beauty of who God is drives us. And, and when people get up and, and make it all about the emotion, that's really easy to be done with tomorrow. Okay? And, and let me give you this example. In John chapter 6, verse 2, it says that this crowd of people are following Jesus because they'd seen him do miracles. They'd seen their loved ones who had been demon-possessed have the demons cast out. They'd seen their loved ones who were blind be able to see. They'd seen their loved ones who were crippled be able to walk. And so people are following Jesus to see what he's going to do next. And then in John 6, he feeds them. 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. He feeds them all with a couple of loaves of, of bread and some fish. And he multiplies it. And in John 6, 26, it says that they're following him the next day because he had fed them. I want you to get that. They're following him the day before because they've seen him do cool miracles. Now they're following him because free food, right? And then Jesus stands up in front of them and he says, listen, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, unless you partake of me, you have nothing to do with me. And he gives them this really hard message that it's not just about the healings. It's not just about the free food. He says, like, unless you, he goes, all that the father gives to me will come to me and I will by no means cast them out, but raise them up on the last day. He says, I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the Bible says they all left. They're like, we're out. They were with them the day before because healings and food. Oh, sorry. They're with them the day before because of healings. They're following him today because of food. But the moment he says, unless you really want me, you have nothing, they're like, see ya. There is a, there is a great cost to following Jesus. I, I am really, really grateful and really, really thankful to God that, uh, that both of my boys know Jesus. I'm really grateful and thankful to God. I wouldn't have married Michelle if she didn't know Jesus. Uh, but when Michelle and I started, we started emailing back and forth first. And we emailed for about a week. Um, before our first date. And then two weeks after our first date, we were looking at rings. It was really fast and a lot of fun. But, but when we were emailing back and forth for that first week, the first couple of days, she had had Christian on, on, on her MySpace profile, if you got to know. Okay, that's, we met on MySpace. Now you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so lots of people call themselves Christians, right? Something, something like 80% of people in the United States call themselves Christians. Something like 30% of people that call themselves Christians think Jesus is necessary to be a Christian. Do the math. 70% of people who call themselves Christians don't think Jesus is necessary to be a Christian. So I'm just telling you there's a big gap between people who call themselves Christians and who actually are. So, so Michelle said that she was a follower of Jesus. And so I just kind of, I said, well, tell me about that. Because I, I wanted to hear like her story. I wanted to hear like if this was something that was real to her or if it was just something that, you know, you say because you live in West Texas and it's what you always did. Right? You know the difference, right? So what we have here is you and I, now listen, don't get me wrong. Some, some, some people will say, we don't follow God for the blessing. That's not entirely true either. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God for anyone who comes to him must first of all believe that he exists and second, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Make no mistake about it. I believe that God is God and that Jesus is his son and that he died for our sins and that he overthrew the power of sin and defeated the power of death. But I'm also here for the blessing that comes from all of that, right? I, I know what comes next. I know of eternal life. I'm not talking about a new house. I'm not talking about new cars. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the kingdom of heaven, right? And so Jesus is laying down this idea. And, he, and he's saying to them, I've come to set a man against uh, his son-in-law, a father, sorry, a, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, father-in-law against son-in-law. And, and what's happening here isn't a division because you baptize differently than we do or because you meet in a different service or your pastor doesn't tuck in his shirt or whatever. What's the, the, the division, or I mean, I mean, how many pastors do you know that wear dinosaur converse? Come on. All right, that's a pretty great requirement right there. But the, the idea here is that as we, like Micah, as we, like Micah, not that Micah, Micah of the Bible, just to be clear, 
This is the only time I wish your name was different. I can't ever preach from the book of Micah without feeling like I'm talking about Micah. But the book of Micah, Micah says, man, my eyes are on you, O God. You are my victory. You are my salvation. And so when we, like Micah, put our eyes on God, it makes a distinction between us and the world who says, man, I'm going to put my eyes on being really good at evil. I'm going to put my eyes on taking care of self and those kinds of things. And so I want to show you something here. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite texts is, well, we'll get there in a second. Let's do another one first. Uh, in, in Luke uh, chapter 9, there's this interesting text. Jesus is walking along and says this. This is the very end of Luke 9, beginning in verse 57. Note takers, Luke 9, 57 through 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, sounds good, glad to have you. That's not what he says, really, I'm just kidding. <laughs> says, they were going along the road and someone said to him, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. This guy says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus goes, I, I don't have a home here. You need to understand if you're following me that this is not my home, okay? To another, he said, follow me. So Jesus says to a second guy, follow me. But he says, Lord, let me go and bury my father first. And Jesus said, let the dead take care of themselves. As for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Third guy, another one said, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me say goodbye to those who are at home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. These are hard statements. They're really hard statements because what Jesus is saying to these guys is their affection for him has to be greater. Their affection for him has to be greater than home, has to be greater than, than dad that died, has to be greater than family. Like th th We have to be singularly focused in following God. It doesn't mean that you can't have a job that you love. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your family. It doesn't mean that, like, th don't, don't take this to this extreme where, like, now you have to be an unhappy Christian. Have you met unhappy Christians? People who are just miserable all the time? And you're just like, man, like, my first instinct isn't like, oh, I'm so sorry. My first instinct is like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, like, like, there is joy in God. There is joy in knowing him. There is joy in knowing that the kingdom of heaven is real. There is joy in knowing that one day the sky will be split and we will see Christ riding the white horse with his, th with his, with his robe dipped in blood upon his thigh, king of kings, lord of lords, and at his heels the host of heaven, and we will be joined with him in the sky and we will be made new. And like there's, there's confidence in that. There's something about that that's like rich and like that's exciting. I, I, I tell you this all the stinking time. It, yesterday, well, I don't tell you this all the stinking time. Let me finish. Sorry. I get ahead of myself. Two and a half years ago, we were given this property, and I still can't believe it was given to us. Yesterday, I was at my studio downtown, my art studio, and a couple stopped in. It was a, I'm never there on Saturdays, uh, but I had to stop by there to meet a client who was picking up a painting. And another couple came in that met me two years ago. They're from San Diego, California. They were in town for a couple of days, stopped by the studio. And, uh, and so we started talking yesterday. And um, I guess they only knew that I was an, an artist. Michelle said, well, he's also a pastor, so we talked for the next hour about church. And I was telling them yesterday, like, how God gave us this building and gave us this land and, like, how you guys have started coming. And I was like, man, it's just, it just blows my mind every day. Like, there is great blessing in knowing God. There is great joy in following God. There is, there is a wealth of, 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 of just pleasure and delight in following God. Psalm 1611 says that in, in the right hand of God are pleasures eternal and his presence is everlasting joy. That's part of why I'm in this because I believe that the real reward, the real pleasure, the real joy is in Christ. And, and I just need you to know that the more we believe that, the bigger the gap becomes between us and the world. Because the world's going to go, to, no, 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 you got to look out for number one. No, 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 you got to store up treasures for yourself. No, 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 it's got to be about what you can get right now and who you can be and what you can make of yourself. And we're like, no, man, I am in this because I believe that in Christ is fullness of life. I believe that in Christ is, is fullness of joy because I believe that in Christ is pleasures eternal. And so, so these guys go, hey, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he goes, yeah, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but I don't have a home. The implication is this guy bells. Second guy, Jesus says, follow me. And he goes, I will. Let me bury my father first. Some people say that his dad's not dead yet, and then he's saying, let me wait till dad dies. Other people are saying that his dad has already died. It's really irrelevant to the text. The point is that this guy says, I got something I, I got to take care of before Jesus. 
The third guy says, I'll follow you wherever you go. He says, let me just go say goodbye to my family first. And Jesus says, no one putting their hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This idea is like we're in and we're all in. I'm here. I'm pressing in. I'll give you another text. Um, Matthew 13, Jesus talks about the word of the kingdom of heaven, and he compares it to seed being thrown on the ground. And he says this. Uh, he says that some of the seed fell on, on the cart path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on rocky soil, really shallow rocky soil, and it sprang up quickly, but when the sun came out, it withered it and destroyed it. Some fell among the thorns, but the thorns grew up faster than the plants and choked it and killed it, and some fell on good soil and produced 30, 60, or 100-fold crop. When he describes the middle two soils, that that fell on rocky soil, he goes, these are the people who heard the word of God and immediately received it with joy, but the moment persecution came, they're like, we're out. The moment it became difficult to follow Jesus, they're like, we're done. Think John 6. The moment it required something of them bigger than they were willing to give, they're done. And then the, the, the seed that fell among the thorns, and, and, the, and the thorns and the weeds grew up faster and choked it out, the Bible says that that is analogous to those who the pleasures of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth kept them from following God. Have you, if you haven't, then praise God, but have you ever, have you met the person yet that for wealth turned away from Jesus? I know a few. That for the sake of money were done with God? Man, that is short-sighted. <laughs> you don't get to buy your way into heaven, you know? That is short-sighted. And, and, and so this idea here is that when we come to Christ, here should be our attitude. And this is where, this is where I, I hope for us to conclude today. But we'll spend some time here. Go to Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Micah for years has run a ministry called 3-8 Ministries. It comes from this text from Philippians 3 verse 8. It'd be really weird if you called it 3-8 Ministries and it came from 3-6. So I probably didn't need to tell you it came from 3.8 because you could probably deduce that because you're all very bright people. But it is first service and you probably haven't eaten breakfast yet because you're saving up room for brunch. How many of you skipped breakfast this morning because you knew you were brunching afterwards? How many of you ate breakfast this morning to prime your stomach for the brunch? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Remember, those of you, if you missed it, uh, the announcements, every single one of you has been invited to brunch after this with a couple in our church right here. Here's Tommy. Wave, Tommy. Yeah, he's invited you to brunch at his house. It's just down the road. Listen to Philippians 3, okay? Philippians 3, uh, I'm going to begin in verse 7. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 7. Note takers, I'm going down through 16. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Okay, I really got to start back in verse 2. So listen to what Paul says. Paul says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers, for those who mutilate the flesh. We can talk about that Wednesday night. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, um, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more so. So Paul's saying this, our confidence is in Christ. Our confidence is not in ourselves. And he says this, he goes, if anyone thinks that the, the, what endears them to God is the works they've done, Paul says, I want you to know, if you think you have confidence in the flesh, I have way more confidence in the flesh than you do. And here's what he says. He, go, he says in verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Isn't that a funny thing to be bragging about, right? Anyway, we can talk about that later. Uh, if you're a Jew, that's super important though. Of the people of Israel, I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's a funny one to me, too. Of Hebrews, I'm the Hebrewist, is what he's saying. Um, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As to zeal, as to passion, I persecuted the church. As to righteousness under the law, not righteousness in Christ, but as to righteousness under the law, perfect. So Paul says, here's my credentials. If you want to say, if you want to say that you can brag in yourself, you can boast in yourself, my credentials are better than yours. That's what Paul's saying. And we miss that a lot of times when we get to verse 7. Whatever gain I had, so being circumcised the eighth day, being an Israelite, being of the tribe of Benjamin, being the Hebrewist Hebrew of them all, right? Being a Pharisee of the law, being perfect according to the law. Paul says, anything that I had gain in, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. 
division. There is a division between what the world values and what Christ values. Paul says, no, I have, I have no value in that anymore. Verse 8, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Not, not just the things he did well. Everything he's ever had, he counts as loss compared to what? Knowing Jesus. Okay? For his sake, I have suffered the loss of everything. And I count everything else as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ, that I would be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. What did he, what did he say earlier? According to righteousness through the law, I'm perfect. And he says, but no, 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 I give up everything I had so that my righteousness doesn't come through the law, but my righteousness comes through Jesus. Okay? So he says that I can be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God by faith, that I can know him and the power of his resurrection, that I can partake in his sufferings, that I can become like him in his death, so that by any means possible I can attain the resurrection of the dead. I need you to hear what Paul's saying here. Paul is saying, look, you're saying, I'm good, I don't need Jesus. I'm good, look at all these good works that I've done. I'm good, look at everything that I've accomplished. I'm a good Jew, I've been circumcised, I'm an Israelite, I'm of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, I'm perfect according to the law. Paul goes, garbage. All of that is garbage compared to knowing Christ. Now, what's that going to do? Think about this for a minute. What is that going to do if you're a first century Jew and you're living according to that philosophy and everyone you know is living according to that philosophy and you come in one day and you go, you know what, that's garbage. It's about Jesus for me. What's that going to do? Division. It's going to set the members of one household against one another. It creates a gap. When we come into the world and we say, all the things you're chasing, garbage, Christ is life. What's it going to do? And if you have a family member, if you have a friend, if you have a close acquaintance who values themselves more than they value Christ, then the gospel, in this case, creates division. What does the gospel do among those who have put faith in Jesus? Unifies. But what does the gospel do with people like Micah of the Bible and those who are good at evil? Division. Paul says, man, I, I consider everything lost for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. I want to suffer like him. I want to share in his death. I want to attain to the resurrection he had. Verse 12, and, and this is key. We always stop in verse 11. We shouldn't. Paul says, not that I've already obtained everything. Not that I've already been made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. He goes, look, I, I'm not perfect. I haven't gotten everything yet. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't have the full knowledge of Christ yet. I don't share in his sufferings completely yet. I haven't, he is like, I don't have it all yet. He goes, but I'll tell you what I do. I press on to take hold of Christ like he took hold of me. That is my daily ambition, to grab hold of Christ with the same uh, fierceness with which he took hold of me. That's what he's saying. That, that's, when Jesus says in Matthew 10, when he says, look, you're going out as sheep among wolves. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to throw you into jail. They're going to beat you. He goes, your, your family members are about to become your enemies. He's, saying, he's inviting them, take hold of me. That's what he's inviting them to. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider yet that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting everything that lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will show you that also. Only let us hold true, let us hold fast to that which we've attained. Here's what Paul says. Listen, everything in my past, garbage compared to knowing Christ. And here's what I, here's what I say. I haven't taken hold of him completely yet, but that is my daily aim. And where I'm missing it, God will show me. Let us just keep pressing on to take hold of Christ. If that's your attitude, listen, I'm not here to tell you, talk to you today about all the things you've gotten wrong. Like, 
how depressing would that be if we all just sat around and said, look, here's all the things I've screwed up. Here's all the ways that I've failed. Here's all the sins that I've committed. Like, okay, we're forgetting what lies behind, and here's what we're saying today. My object is Jesus. My goal is Jesus, and I press on to take hold of him. Haven't gotten it all yet, but I press on to take hold of him for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, and what I'm missing, he will reveal to me so that I can better take hold of him, and here's the result. As I better take hold of him, the division becomes evident. People all the time say you shouldn't act like the world, and then they, t- they give you a list of things you should or should not do. Here's, here's what we ought to teach. If you're like Micah of the Old Testament, if you fix your eyes on God, and if you're like Paul of the New Testament who chases after holding God, the division is automatic. The separation between you and the world is created not by you doing or not doing the right things. The division between you and the world is created by what? Your love of God. It'll happen. The world doesn't love them. Jesus says, I didn't come for peace, but division. I didn't come for unity. I didn't come for peace, but a sword. I didn't come for unity, but division. The church should be unified. We've talked about that in the past. That is not the point today. Do not take that away from here that we should be divided with other believers. That is absolutely 100% not the case. But as we take hold of Christ, we 100% will be divided with the world. That brings us to our prayer today. God, give us the strength to follow Jesus with all boldness, regardless of the price. God, give us the strength to follow Jesus with all boldness, regardless of the price. Would you take just a moment to pray that where you're seated? God, what this makes me think about is that we have a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. People who have gone before us. People like Micah. And people like Paul. And all the Marys that came and anointed your body, Lord Christ. We have people who have gone before us, who have run this race well who have set for us the example of what it means to follow you. God, some of us in this room have the example of our grandparents or our parents, godly friends and mentors who have carried us along the way. And we know, Lord, that it is not our business to make friends with the world, but it is our business to know you to forsake everything else, to take hold of you, to count every other thing rubbish, to count every other thing garbage, to count every other thing as meaningless for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. And we ask God that though we have not yet taken hold of it, we ask that we would be encouraged and strengthened today by your spirit at work within us to press on, to know you and to hold you and to take hold of you with our lives. And we recognize, God, that for some of us, that will immediately cause us to have enemies. 
And as we press deeper into your heart, Lord, it will cause a divide between us and those who don't know you. God, give us steadfastness. Give us endurance. Give us courage and boldness and strength to continue going in the face of the wolves that oppose us.